and I think that's uh, at least polite for those people that have turned up on time so that we don't sort of drag this out too late in the evening. Um, so I'd like just to thank everybody for attending this webinar um, and thank Tanya Bosch and the Ministry for helping organise this and also Sandra Sunjik who's been the Project Officer coordinating the training around the depot uh, buprenorphine in New South Wales. I also want to acknowledge the, um, the land upon which, um, well, that I'm in. I'm in Gadigal land um, of the Eora Nations. Just want to acknowledge uh, Aboriginal peoples, uh, elders, past, present and future um, and the work that we're about to, to commence. So this evening we're going to be going through uh, a training program for opioid treatment providers around opioid um, opioid treatment with the Depo buprenorphine products. This is a presentation that um, the training package has been funded by New South Wales Health. Um, the authors are myself and Adrian Dunlop. Um, that's where we come from, from South East Sydney and Hunter, New England, local health districts. And there's some disclosures about our involvement with relevant companies, both with Brayburn, Camerus, um, Indivia of particular note. I also just want to highlight that the work we're going to be going through today really builds upon the guideline documents that were published by New South Wales Health and are available on the internet. You can see the links there. There's two documents. One is the, um, the big document, the comprehensive guidelines. They go for about 60 odd pages and they have a lot of detail about the ins and outs of using the various depot buprenorphine products. We also, though, developed the abbreviated guidelines or the brief clinical guidelines. That's sort of a 10-page version of the guidance and it's far sort of more easily accessible and it's your quick go-to uh, reference guide. It reflects that it, for most cases, 90% of all the clinical scenarios, the brief guidelines will provide adequate information for the clinicians in terms of how to uh, deliver treatment. Also, just to give this in context, that this is building upon the New South Wales clinical guidelines and they're also available there on the internet. Um, the guidelines were developed by an interdisciplinary um, group. Nurses, doctors, um, consumers, pharmacists were involved in the process. Um, we also just want to highlight that the guidelines and this training package uh, actually reflects best available evidence. From time to time, the evidence that we have built our guidelines and the training package around may not always align with the TGA approvals for Buvidal and Sublocade and that's because when the time came for us to write the guidelines there actually was some available evidence that we thought was important to be um, incorporating into the guidance that did not necessarily reflect the way that the products have been licensed by the TGA. As we all know sometimes we do engage in off-label prescribing um, and generally what we want to see is some guidelines that protect our clinicians when you're going to be doing off-label prescribing and that was one of the reasons why we wanted to also make sure that these guidelines were available uh, for our clinicians in New South Wales. So um, background to the workshop, so they're the, the overarching Learning objectives that we're aimed to achieve over the course of this evening, so understand the pharmacology um, of the medications, how to prescribe the depot buprenorphine with a focus on induction, um, how to change, how to prescribe um, the, the, the medications, how to administer the medications, so administering depot buprenorphine injections, to be aware of some of the important dimensions of incorporating depot treatment into routine care, so that means how do we wrap it around psychosocial interventions and also working with particular special populations and also we'll be touching on some of the regulatory issues about how we can use these medications in clinical practice. So there are our learning objectives. Just to let you know that over the course, um, you'll hear people referring to these products in different ways. We've gone with the language of depot buprenorphine. Um, some some services and some places are using the language of long-acting injectable buprenorphine. They're fairly interchangeable. Um, in general, we'll be using the generic term of depot buprenorphine when we mean either product. 
However, sometimes we'll be referring specifically to Bouvidal when we mean Bouvidal and sometimes the Sublocade when we mean Sublocade. The two medications, the two formulations are slightly different. And we may follow this time frame. Um, we'll see how we go. It's always different doing it on a webinar. Uh, we will try to, it's a long session we've got planned, so we will try to have a bit of a break, maybe a five, ten minute break, um, maybe about two thirds of the way through, just to give people a chance to um, have a, a health break um, and stretch their legs and then come back to the, to the session. Um, now, just before we get going, just to reiterate Tanya's point, if people can stay on mute whilst um, we're presenting, there'll be various points in time where I'll pause, ask for questions, and if people want to um, take themselves off mute and ask questions. Also, there is a chat function. Just to be aware that whilst I'm presenting and sharing my screen, I can't see the chat. But um, we'll save up the chat, and maybe when it comes to the questions at the end of each section, we can then pop in and um, maybe if Tanya can read out some of the, the chat question, uh, the, the issues coming up in the chat session. Sure. We also will be recording this session. So um, uh, just so that there, there may be other um, people that want to um, have a look at the, the workshop at a later stage who can't join us tonight on the webinar. Okay, let's make a start. So, opioid dependence. Uh, most of you are clinicians who are practicing in this area, so you'd be familiar with much of this. Opioid dependence, it's a chronic condition. It affects somewhere up to about 1% of the adult population, and it's associated with a whole range of physical, psychological, and social harms for the individual and the community. You see there that there's a number of treatment pathways that we have available to us. Individuals can either come through the withdrawal pathway, and from there, after withdrawal, we'll get post-withdrawal treatments, which are non-medication, non-agonist based, either counselling, resi rehab, um, self-help programs, and also um, in some, some cases we use opioid antagonists, naltrexone. The main state of treatment though are patients coming through opiate agonist treatment with methane or buprenorphine. This tends to be a longer term treatment. Um, eventually patients have to come off their opiate agonist treatment. And the reason the majority of patients, where well, most patients sit in, in this treatment modality is because it's safe and it's effective and it's effective for, the, for large numbers of patients. So it's easily incorporated into long-term community-based um, treatment models. Um, and because opiate agonist treatment works so well, um, it sort of patients are attracted to it. I also just want to highlight that if we were giving this lecture 20 years ago, it would have been exclusively talking about heroin use. Increasingly, I think we're all aware that we're seeing more and more individuals who are also using prescription opioids, um, often in the context of chronic pain, um, and we'll be touching upon some of those issues as we go through the presentation. Most of you will be familiar with buprenorphine. Um, it's a partial mu opioid agonist. Um, what a partial agonist means, you can see there in the, the diagram. Um, so, um, um, well, you can see the partial agonist essentially means you have ceiling opioid effects, which means that above a certain dose, you don't get a stronger agonist effect, um, and this imparts much of the safety for buprenorphine. It means that it's much safer um, uh, in terms of the dosing. Um, it's very, very difficult to um, cause respiratory depression with buprenorphine on its own. And this is particularly relevant when we're going to be talking about some of the depot products because um, we often are looking at, at, at plasma levels which are much higher than sometimes what we achieve with the sublingual products. Um, again, most of you will be familiar, we've been using buprenorphine first as a tablet and later as a film for about 20 odd years now in Australia. So Australia is one of the first countries to introduce buprenorphine. And it um, now accounts for about 30 to 40 percent of all opioid treatment in Australia. It's actually sort of been around that level now for the last 10 years. Um, so methadone occupies around two thirds of all our treatment historically, buprenorphine the other third. That may well change with the depot formulations. It'll be interesting to see where we are in five to 10 years time. 
So that's um, opioid treatment, that's buprenorphine. Now, what are these new depot buprenorphine medications? So we have two new products available to us. Depo buprenorphine is available both as a weekly and as a monthly subcutaneous injections. And the whole rationale around the development of depo buprenorphine really has to do, like all depo products, it basically means patients do not have to um, uh, take a medication on a daily basis. This means that in the context where we're where we have predominantly a supervised treatment model with methadone and buprenorphine. This generally means much less frequency of attendance at clinics and pharmacies for dosing. Because of the costs associated with uh, pharmacy dosing and also travel for patients, this is likely to have a significant reduction in the, in the cost burden for individual patients. Um, and you can see then obviously some benefits there for convenience for patients and for service providers. The fact that patients, that we don't give takeaway doses largely with depot treatment, that means that we see much less risk of non-medical use of medications. So if we aren't giving out takeaways, then there's much less scope for diversion of medications to others or patients themselves injecting buprenorphine that was designed for sublingual use and so forth. So this increases the safety uh, from a community perspective. And also another area we'll be talking about this is that with the depot product, it, there's just much less capacity for patients missing doses. So we see much greater adherence to uh, medication and this can be associated with better outcomes for some patients. So that's the rationale as to why the depot products were introduced. And let's look at the two products that we have available. The first product that was licensed um, is the Bouvedal product. This is manufactured and distributed by Camerus, which is a Swedish company that's now set up in Australia. Now we have seven different Bouvedal products available to us. There are four weekly uh, uh, injections, um, uh, doses and they come in 8, 16, 24 and 32 and we have three monthly formulations 64, 96 and 128 milligrams. These all come in a pre-filled syringes, they're very small volumes so you look at those volumes 0.16 to 0.67 mils this means that they're very small injections um, when, when we're administering them to patients. It's very important, one of the key issues around the depot products for both products, they are licensed to not be dispensed to patients or carers. So the injections must be administered by a healthcare professional. Um, they should never ever be dispensed to the patient uh, to take away. So this will come up later on when we're talking some of the models of care and how um, some of the ways that we may be implementing depot treatment um, in the community settings. Um, the Bouvedal products are stored at room temperature and there's a range of places where the injections can be um, uh, given, so buttock, abdomen, arms and thighs. So there's a range of options for where we can administer the, the Bouvedal. This slide, which is entitled Bouvedal Pharmacokinetic Profile for those on the telephone, um, so this gives you a sort of an overview of the pharmacology of the Bouvedal products. The whole concept of the Bouvedal products, largely both products more or less have work on a similar concept, that the buprenorphine is impregnated in a matrix. Um, the matrix tends to be a, uh, a liquid. Um, it's a, they're both clear solutions. Then as the product is injected, it comes into contact with water from the subcutaneous um, interstitial tissue. That water then gets absorbed. As it gets absorbed, the liquid of the injection forms into a, into, um, a gel or liquid crystal um, and that slowly then, um, the drug then is slowly released according to the the, the matrix itself as to whether or not it's released over a seven day period or a four week period. You see there on the top right panel, that that's the kinetic um, modeling uh, for what happens with a one week injection of Bouvedal. 
And you can see really the difference there between, say, sublingual dosing, where you see a peak and a trough every day, sort of on that 24-hour sort of cycle. What you see with the Buvidal injection, you will see more of a plateau effect, lower peaks, lower troughs, and sort of more in the middle. And you can see there also in the bottom right-hand panel, that's the modelling as to what you see with a monthly injection. So again, you see um, sort of a lower peak and a, um, a higher trough than what you see with um, the, the weekly products. It's important to appreciate the pharmacology of Buvidal. The weekly product has a half-life of around three to five days. Um, and you get peak effects after the weekly injection of around 12 to 24 hours after the dose. So if you administered a Buvidal weekly at 10 a.m. in the morning, it is that evening and over the course of that night that the peak effects of the Buvidal will be experienced. The Buvidal monthly, the peak effects actually happen much more quickly, so within six hours after an injection, you can see the half-life there is around three weeks. And that's important. Think about what happens then when you have a half-life of around three weeks and we administer the drug every four weeks, what you will see happening is accumulation of the dose. So you, uh, what we see with both the Buvidal weekly and the monthly products, with each injection, you get slightly higher plasma levels and so it really takes around three to five injections before patients truly stabilise on a particular dose. And that's just the, you know, that's just the kinetics of, of accumulation with long-acting drugs. So that's the pharmacology of Buvidal. Let's look at the Sublocade products. So Sublocade is manufactured by Indivia. Sublocade has got a slightly different model. It's a, they comes as only monthly dose options, the 100 and the 300 milligram doses. Um, so there's no weekly product with the sublocade. It also comes in pre-filled uh, syringes ready to use. The, the volumes are higher with the 300 milligram dose. So the 100 milligram is also a small injection, 0.5 mils. The 300 milligram dose though, it's a 1.5 mil injection. So that's a, you know, it's a bigger injection. And for a subcut injection, that's, sort of um, um, is slightly, uh, patients do report that they feel the injection there more with the, the, the higher volume. Same story with the sublocate, never to be supplied to a patient or the carer, it's only to be handled by healthcare uh, professionals. Now sublocate requires cold storage, um, um, uh, cold storage Schedule 8 requirements, which means it must be stored between the temperatures of 2 and 8 degrees Celsius in a Schedule 8, so in a safe. Now, very few services, very few facilities actually have Schedule 8 cold storage capacity. So generally, many what um, if you have that, so if you work in a hospital or a big clinic that has that um, storage capacity, then that's great, you can use Sublocade that way. Alternatively, Sublocade can um, survive at room temperature for up to seven days. So we'll look at some of the models of distribution that Indivia um, uh, have developed for the Sublocade, because there are ways that even if you don't have cold storage, you can still use Sublocade, and we'll look at some of the ways that that will happen. Now, the sublocade can only be administered into the subcutaneous area in the abdomen, so you don't have the flexibility of buttocks and upper arms and thighs as you do with the Buvidal. The, the, it's the same kind of principles around, it's a, it's a matrix product, so the buprenorphine is embedded in the matrix for the sublocade. The sublocade uses a different matrix um, to the Buvidal product. It's a much longer acting uh, matrix, so it's slow, it decays uh, more slowly than the Buvidal um, gel. So you can see the half-life for the sublocade is really double the Buvidal half-life. So remember, the we're looking at around about a three-week half-life for Buvidal monthly. The sublocade has got a 
six-week half-life. So it's a much longer half-life. And you can see there, this is the issue about cum accumulation of, of, of uh, plasma levels with repeated doses of a long-acting drug. You can see what happens with, the, with those two um, graphs there about what happens if you keep dosing a patient with 300 milligrams, you can see what happens. Um, the, the plasma levels continue to increase over time. They eventually do reach steady state after about the fifth or so injection. Um, alternatively, you can see what happens with a 300, 100, and that you'll see it. in a moment, is the standard dosing, and um, you get the, the, the uh, loading effects with the first two high doses, and then if you drop back to the 100 milligrams, you can see there that you, you've achieved steady state more quickly with the 100 milligrams when you use that dosing, sort of a loading dose principle. Um, and this is a slide that comes from the guidelines. This is work that Adrian and I, we went and pulled all the, con all the published data that was available, looking at sublingual, buprenorphine, sublocade, Buvidal weekly, and Buvidal monthly. So what this allows you to do is look at the sort of approximate plasma levels that you achieve with the different formulations. And this allows you to give you, it provides you a sense of the kinds of doses you achieve with different products. Now, just to orient you to that, each bar re refers to a particular dose strength. Um, the, the bottom number, for example, if we look at the 16 milligram sublingual buprenorphine, you can see there that's the third um, bar from the left. Um, the C min, so that's the average minimum concentration you see over a 24 hour dosing window is 1.05. The C max is the peak um, plasma level you will see, which is 6.72, and the the mid bar is 1.9, and that refers to the C average. So that's the average plasma level. So in many respects, the average plasma level is the one which is more indicative as to what you will see over a monthly depot injection, for example. So you can see there what happens with the Bouvidal weekly, the Bouvidal monthly. They're all roughly in the similar sort of ballpark as is the Sublocade 100. Um, they all produce very similar plasma levels as what we achieve with the sublingual buprenorphine. It's fair to say that the high dose Sublocade, the 300 milligram dose, produces quite higher doses, as does the 128 milligram that produces quite high C max levels as well. So there is the potential with the high dose monthlies that some patients will experience quite high plasma levels of buprenorphine. And this becomes an issue if patients have got, are coming from low buprenorphine doses. Okay, a couple more slides and then we'll pause for some questions. Um, the evidence, do these medications work? Well, there's been quite a lot of um, studies that have been published. There's a full reference list in the final slide, so you'll be able to go and chase up these references if you want. Um, and they're also uh, summarised in the clinical guidelines, um, if people want to look those up. So in a nutshell, what we see is both Bouvidal and Sublocade produce blockade effects. So that is, if you use heroin or other opioids on top of the Bouvidal and Sublocate, it will diminish the effects, the, the subjective effects experienced by heroin and other opioids. Both Bouvidal and Sublocate um, have been shown in randomised controlled trials to be effective in reducing heroin and other opioid use and to keep patients in treatment. Um, and also now there's been um, at least one study um, published internationally, which was an effectiveness study. And that was really looking at sort of long-term treatment with patients treated under naturalistic conditions. Um, and you can see there quite good treatment retention was, um, was experienced in those studies. So we're fairly confident that, that the depo buprenorphine medications um, have been shown to work. Very soon, Australia, actually New South Wales, has been at the forefront of much of the research going on around the world with um, depo buprenorphine. So very, very soon we'll be seeing three additional studies um, that we'll be able to add to this list. So there's been some research being done in prison settings in New South Wales 
Um, that's the UNLOCK study where we've been looking at uh, the use of Bouvardale in prison settings. I think many of you will be aware now that Bouvardale is being widely used in, by Justice Health for a lot of patients in correctional um, settings uh, being treated with buprenorphine. So that's the UNLOCK study. We're about, we've completed the DEBU study. The DEBU study was a randomised open label study comparing Bouvardale to sublingual Suboxone. Um, uh, with a 24 week or six month treatment period. That study's been completed. We'll be presenting those findings very, very shortly. Um, and in a nutshell, what we can say is that there was, uh, the primary endpoint there was looking at patient satisfaction measures and there was very high levels of patient satisfaction with the Bouvardale superior to the Suboxone. Um, and there's one other study currently underway, and that's looking at an open label study of Sublocade, and that's also underway in New South Wales, also in some sites in Victoria and South Australia, and that's looking at Sublocade under naturalistic conditions. So we've been very, very fortunate in New South Wales that we've been using these products in clinical trials, and that's really allowed us to develop up some experience, write the guidelines, write, write the training programs, and really hit the ground running in New South Wales um, having some clinicians that know how to use these medications. Um, side effects or adverse events, while we can first, let's not forget, buprenorphine is buprenorphine. So really this is, the depot is really just a different formulation, a different way of getting buprenorphine into patients. So many of the systemic or general adverse events that you see with buprenorphine, you will see with depot as well. So as you all know, some patients will get nausea, constipation, headache, poor sleep to buprenorphine. They get it with sublingual bup. They are probably going to also get it with depo buprenorphine as well. Be aware, remember that there is a time, you know, the, that with, with the depo products, often you will see peak plasma effects in the first one, two or three days after an injection. And so you're most likely going to see the peak side effects in those first few days after an injection. So whenever you're considering is this a side effect or not, always consider the time frame of when did these symptoms start and does it correspond with the peak effects of a, of a depot product. Um, this becomes particularly relevant, you'll see um, when some patients think that the depot isn't working, when in fact it is working, if anything they may be getting too much buprenorphine and we'll look at that issue in a moment. The other key difference though with the depot is that we are injecting patients with these medications and so we do see local injection related adverse events in around 10 to 15% of patients. These are almost always mild, tolerated and transient. So we very rarely ever have to abandon treatment with the depot products because of the local injection sites. Um, the kinds of things you see is a bit of pain, a bit of swelling, a bit of redness and it as I said, it usually settles down, uh, resolves spontaneously within a, within a few days. Um, we've mentioned some of the advantages of depot treatment. Um, some of those are obvious things like you don't have to turn up for, you know, for dosing as much, that reduces the cost, it enhances um, convenience. But we also should be thinking about some of the other impacts, for example, for patients in regional or rural areas that often have to travel to, say, you know, one community pharmacy in a country town. Um, it often becomes very, very difficult under those circumstances to maintain confidentiality and there's a whole range of issues around stigma uh, when patients have to, you know, go off to get their doses every day. So there's a whole range of issues that I think many of the patients on the depot medications do describe that it allows them to actually just integrate their, their care much more effectively without sort of being identified um, as a patient on, you know, on buprenorphine treatment. There are a range of advantages, but we also really need to highlight not all patients want depot treatment. So some patients will not like the side effects of the depots. Some patients don't like injections. Some patients will describe that they are losing the autonomy that they had over their, over their use of takeaway medications. So if you're already a patient getting monthly Suboxone takeaways, then you would have to ask yourself, what's the advantage of going onto a depot? So 
not everyone is going to be sold on a depot product, and I think it's really important that we never lose sight of the importance of, uh, of collaborative decision making in treatment and informed consent. And that's really highlighted in this next slide, that whenever we've been working with consumer groups, um, the key things that really get highlighted are the importance that this is um, collaborative in terms of the, the, the decision to go on to depot buprenorphine. Part of that requires clear and simple information for patients to understand um, what's involved. We really want to just make a shout out now in terms of where can patients get that information. Both companies have got good product information, so um, both the Subbulcade and the Bouverdal client literature from the drug companies, both are good. We also are fortunate um, in New South Wales, Newer have also developed some really good resources, client resources around the depot products, and I would uh, without hesitation refer everyone to go look at the newer websites, um, and you can download those um, information booklets. So there's the big booklet, and there's also a, a, a brief flyer, sort of like a two-page version, which is an easier way to sort of introduce the concept of depots, and then you can follow up with a more comprehensive booklet. I think it's also important that when we're talking to our patients, all patients should be given the option that if it's not working, don't worry, you can always go back to sublingual if for whatever reason the depot doesn't work for you. The, um, the graphic there really comes from some of the work we did in one of our earlier studies where we asked patients who had been on sublingual buprenorphine previously who transferred over to depot, and we asked those patients, you've had both, you've had sublingual, you've had depot, which do you prefer? You can see there, 83% of patients had a, a preference for the depot, about 10% of patients didn't care that much, and about 10% uh, preferred the sublingual. In our clinical work, that proportion seems about right. That's about roughly what we're seeing, around eight to nine out of 10 patients um, are quite happy to go onto the, de onto the depot products um, and stay on it. Um, but not everyone, not everyone wants the depot products. Um, I might just throw it open for some questions. Um, and whilst I'm doing that, I will flick over to the videos. Let's see if I can make that work. Um, any questions from anyone? And Tanya, I won't, I'll stay on full presenting, so you may want to read out if there's any good, good things that have come up in the chat room. Okay. Oh. I've got a question. It's Caesar here in Wellington. Yep. Um, can um, can patients be given more than 128 of Bovidal? Yes, they can. We'll look at the actual how we prescribe Bovidal and how we prescribe yeah. Sublocade in the next section. So up to now, we've been talking about what are the products, general orientation, and then we'll spend a little bit of time exactly how you prescribe Bovidal and supplicate in the next in the next um, set of in the next set of slides. Oh, I see. Thank you. Nick Gordon has a few questions for you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, I was going to ask. Okay, sounds like your actual outline of Bubidal and um, and supplicate appears that Bubidal sounds the more superior product. Is this really the case? No. Look, at the end of the day, let's not forget, guys. Buprenorphine is buprenorphine. So we are talking about different formulations of getting buprenorphine into a patient. At the end of the day, it's buprenorphine that is doing the work. So I don't think that we can say, and there is certainly no evidence to tell us, that the efficacy of one is better than the other. So it really gets down to logistics and practicalities of handling the medications. So. There are some advantages to Bouvidal, and, um, and there are some advantages to Sublocade. Bouvidal, obviously, you've got your weekly and your monthly options. Um, so there's great, it's greater flexibility around the doses, and we'll look at that in a moment. With the Sublocade, Sublocade, you can see from just the pharmacology of it, tends to have a much longer duration of effect, um, and we're now seeing some patients being able to get away with doses 
less often than every four weeks. So there may be some patients that like the sublocate, um, that, you know, the longevity of it. At the end of the day, though, remember, it is buprenorphine. So really, the differences are less about does one work better than the other. The difference is really about the logistics of handling these medications more than anything else. So a lot of that will end up upon individual practice issues. You know, you may have a practice that predominantly uses Buvidal. Another practice may predominantly use Sublocade. But look, we'll return to those issues around which one do you want to use in your practice once we've actually looked at how we prescribe the two medications, because I think that will help you understand the role of the medications. Um, and also towards the end, we'll look at some of the issues around ordering the, the products logistically. How do, you, how do you actually get the drugs into, your, into the patient logistically? What's the chain of, chain of drug command, if you know what I mean? Nick, this might be an opportunity to remind people to mute their microphones. Um, there is a little bit of background noise, eating and so on. So everybody, do what Tanya told you to do. <laughs> Alrighty. I'm now going to show you the first of the consumer slides. Now I hope this works. Uh, there we go. Put it on slideshow. Uh, Nick, it's Tanya, but you must have your headphones still in because we're not getting any of the video um, sound. Uh -huh. We might be able to send the link for, for this instead if you can't sort that. You can read the captions down the bottom.
So we'll send through a link for those who are on the phone and can't read the um, the subtitles. So Nick, it's Tanya. Are you um, the first video is finished? Are you going to skip the second one? Nick is not going to put the second video on because it's not working properly. So um, he'll continue with the presentation shortly.